This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com. Today is my special guest. We have a gentleman that's contacted me. He is the older brother of Tom Cole. You may have heard the name Tom Cole from the WWE Ring Boys scandal that was settled back in the 90s. But this is Lee Cole, the older brother that wanted to clear up a few things about that whole situation. I understand there's going to be more information coming out about this in the next week or so through various other media articles. But how are you doing tonight, Lee? I'm doing fine, thank you. So you are obviously the older brother of Tom. How did he get involved as a, as a WWE ring boy? For anyone that doesn't know, I guess... In those days, WWE used to hire local kids to to help set up the rings. I don't know if they hired them directly or if that deal was contracted out. How did how did your brother become involved in that? Well, well what what they did is uh, uh, there was a Mel Phillips, and he would look for uh, kids for, uh, from broken families, and he would invite them to. Uh, come help him uh, set up the ring. Uh, it was totally illegal what he was doing because most of the boys were 13, 14, 15 years old. He would pay them basically out of their pockets. They never received checks, but they did work as setting up the ring and uh, uh, whatever else that he was trying to do with these young boys. And what happened was my brother uh, came up to visit me in Utica and uh, I asked him why he wasn't with uh, wrestling anymore because at this time he was 20 years old and uh, he started working uh, for them uh, in another uh, department and he, he eventually came out and told me that uh, he lost his job because uh, he was being sexually harassed by uh, Terry Garvin who was uh, a superior to uh, Mel Phillips and um, so he lost his job and uh, um, and when he went to Mel and said that um, he was supposed to, Terry Garvin made uh, passes at him, and he refused the passes, um, he, uh, Terry uh, let him go. Um, but the fact of the matter was, was that Mel Phillips uh, started finding these kids when they were 13, 14, 15 years old, and he would pretty much groom them. He would find the ones that he liked best, and he would keep them around. And he had a foot fetish, and he used to do things with his feet, and uh, sexually, uh, uh, he's done other things with the boys, and uh, um, it, it, it wasn't pretty. And my brother was telling me about this, and uh, he told me at that time that he was uh, that he spoke to a reporter named Phil Munchnik of the New York Post. So uh, I got on the phone with Phil, and uh, once Phil told me what was going on, I was pretty upset, and. So we went and found a lawyer in uh, Utica, and that lawyer notified the WWF, that's what they were called at that time, that they, he was going to, uh, that he was, they were being sued. And so um, from that point, it just took a crazy turn. And um, uh, as soon as people found out about the lawsuit, we started getting calls on the phone and stuff from major networks and stuff. And one of the networks was uh, Geraldo Rivera, who had a show. And his, uh, I got a call from um, a Brooke Skulski. She was, uh, at that time, um, she was the producer for his show. And I told her, please not to call uh, right now because there's a lawsuit that's about to be uh, put down on the, uh, on the um, WWF. But she threatened me and said, look, if you don't talk to me, I'm going to park my van out in your front lawn and uh, we'll stay out there until you do talk to me. So at that time, we decided that we would have her come into Utica. And um, from that point on, uh, uh, we did a taping up there. She wasn't satisfied with it. So she asked us to come down to New York City and meet with Geraldo Rivera. And uh, so we did that. And uh uh, from that point, it, it just took uh, uh, many, many turns. So Mel Phillips, he was the ring announcer, the African-American ring announcer. Terry Garvin was an agent. 
Uh, the years this happened was what, 91 and 92, that these uh, incidents no, actually? Uh, it started in the 80s okay. uh, because when my brother was uh, 13 and 14, it was in the late 80s. Uh, and that's when it started. Um, and, uh, and basically, uh, like I said, he would choose uh, certain boys to stay around. And uh, Tom was one of those boys. Um, and uh, he faced a lot of sexual harassment from uh, him, uh, Terry Garvin, and uh, Pat Patterson. And um, it was pretty much uh, known by Vince McMahon and Linda McMahon what was going on, but they really never did anything to stop it. What are some examples of the sexual harassment that they were allegedly doing to him? Well, one, uh, he had a foot fetish. Uh, um, Mel Phillips had a foot fetish, and he used to grab the boy's feet and play with the boy's feet and uh, it kind of uh, relieved himself. And uh, uh, he did this with quite a few boys over the years. As a matter of fact, he even had a boy uh, that they called Mrs. Phillips because he used to help Mel go look for the boys to bring back to Mel. And, um, uh, and that's how it started in, the, uh, in, in, well, he was doing it in the late seventies and eighties and everybody always knew about it. Um, uh, and so that's what he did. But what happened after that, uh, the sexual harassment is like Pat Patterson would grab him by the crotch and, uh, my brother would grab by the crotch when he was walking in the back room and say really dirty things to him. And, uh. Terry uh, Garvin was known for wanting to sleep with the younger, uh, well, the ring boys that started hitting that 18, 19 years of age. Uh, and it was like one big line. They started with uh, Mel and Mel would groom them for Terry. And uh, that was pretty much how they would do it. I see. Now, when you said that he got, kind of got off on the foot fetish, would he actually be like jerking off while touching their yeah. feet. Yes. See, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, uh, talk that he didn't. And, uh, but, um, what I found out over the years is from talking to, uh, uh, people that I tracked down, uh, yes, he did relieve himself. Where would this happen? Obviously it's not going to happen right at the arena. It happened on the roads. He would take him into the motels at night uh, he would keep them on the road. And it was like what he basically did is he looked for boys from broken families with the parents, you know, and when we came from a broken family and uh, he would look for those type of boys because he knew that he would have a better chance uh, with these kids and the parents not really f trying to find out what was going on. So did your brother actually appear on Geraldo Rivera? Yes. Well, what happened is uh, Greg Rivera did the taping. And uh, he, and when he did the taping, um, that's when everything really started getting crazy because um, Brooke, uh, at that time, Brooke Skalski, who was the producer, she said to us, why are you using that small town lawyer? Um, we have a lawyer here uh, that I know. Uh, and it turned out it was her her boyfriend. But he could not um, take the case because he had conflicts of interest. He also worked uh, for the company that uh, was associated with the WWF. So what happened is we met with his father and the father got involved and the father found us another lawyer uh, who turned out to really uh, do a number on the lawsuit and uh uh, behind uh, Tom's back. Now, there was a meeting, I guess, that Tom had with Vince and Linda. Were you at that meeting, too? or you're only I was supposed about to be. I was supposed to be, and they came in on a Sunday. And when they came in on a Sunday, the, the city was dead, and uh, it was right on uh, across from the public library uh, building there. And so right before the, I, we were set to go to the meetings, the lawyer called me up and asked me not to come to the meeting. Uh, so at that time, um, I regretted not going, but I figured the lawyer knew what he was doing. So uh, Tom went to the meeting with uh, two lawyers, uh, Alan Fuchberg and 
John Pelosi, and uh, they went to the meeting, and uh, uh, and that's when Vince came in with uh, Linda, and that was on a Sunday, and they started negotiating, and uh, it, it all got out of control during that negotiation because there was a stack full of uh, shows that were calling us, uh, literally a stack from every major show on TV that wanted to speak to Tom. And that was going to be part of the negotiation with Vince. And uh, yet um, it really wasn't used by uh, uh, the lawyer. And I, and I uh, found out that the lawyer was negotiating with Jerry McDivitt uh, at nighttime from home to home and that without even letting us know that he was negotiating at that time with Jerry McDivitt. And so a lot of things happened before Tom even went into that meeting. And the lawyer even left the room and left Tom alone with Vince McMahon. And if anybody knows Vince McMahon, you don't leave someone alone with him. He's a very intimidating character that is, uh, he's a phony and he pretty much comes off a certain way. And, uh, so basically, uh, Tom settled to get his job back in $100,000. So how long did Tom work for them when that sexual harassment was going on? And why did he continue working there if that type of stuff was happening? Because he loved wrestling. Um, he, what he did is he did what a lot of the wrestlers were doing. Like I spoke to Bruno San Martino. And Bruno told me uh, that it, it was rampant and everybody knew what Mel was doing. And that, and Billy Graham, I spoke to him, and it was the same way. They both did depositions for us, and they both said the same thing. It was rampant and out of control, and uh, that Vince knew about it, and uh, Linda knew about it, and um, they just chose uh, not to do anything about it. And um, uh, that's pretty much what happened there. So why were you so close to the situation, just because you were close with your brother and yeah, was well, telling- I was like, well, my brother, you know, he, he was a pretty wild kid and he, he decided to come up state and live with me and he came and lived with me and he told me and I, I never thought about getting involved. I never realized it was going to take that snowball effect that it took and it just got out of control. But when I talked to Phil Munchnik, uh, uh, Phil said to me, he goes, so who's your lawyer? And at that point. I realized that, hey, who's our lawyer? I mean, this is, you know, Tom was uh, sexually harassed, lost his job, and um, something had to be done. And uh, uh, once uh, they uh, once they learned to Tom, they uh, sent their private investigators out looking for us, trying to find out who was behind these charges and exactly where they lived and everything. We were literally being followed. Uh, once they did find out. So the settlement you say was for $55,000 and Tom getting well, his job yes. back? Uh, well, what happened is my brother came back to the, mot- the hotel. It w- we were staying above Grand Central Station. Uh, I believe it was called the Plaza at that time. I'm not sure, though. And um, he came in the room and he said, Lee, um, I-, I decided to settle. And then when he told me, uh, the other lawyer that was with him said, your brother really messed up making a settlement here. He says, that guy's a snake and there shouldn't have been no settlement. See, even that lawyer was shocked that our main lawyer basically went in this direction. And so at that point, um, uh, Vince didn't know about me until my brother told him. And it was like Vince was like, oh, then there's somebody else involved besides Tom. And so what happened was Vince got a hold of us and said, why don't you meet us tomorrow? We're going to be going on the Phil Donahue show and uh, we'd like to meet you. Uh, uh, Well, what happened is Tom went over there with his lawyer and then I went over and we met at uh, Rockefeller Center. And uh, Vince uh, was there with uh, Elizabeth um, at that time. They gave us the whole show when they showed up. There was a couple of limousines and stuff. And uh, they took us to the green room and um, they wanted to set up the uh, people that were on the show talking about what was going on with uh, uh, with with the wrestling uh, and that how Vince knew and everything. And um, but at that time, they realized that Tom settled because 
there was a rumor going around that Tom was sitting in the audience with Linda McMahon, and he was. And I was in the back room, in the green room. And just so you do know, I was pretty upset because I did not like the way this whole situation was going, and I thought it was totally wrong, the settlement. But it's not my name on the contract. It wasn't really up to me. Do you have any idea whatever happened to uh, Tom or Mel Phillips? Because we never really heard from Garvin or Phillips again after that. Of course, Pat Patterson temporarily retired and then he came yes. back. Never in the what same happened, position. Yeah. What happened is... Uh, um, uh, as soon as the lawsuit came out, Phil Munchnik uh, wrote an article for the New York Post, and it was on the back page. It was a huge story. And uh, so at that time, uh, they knew the pressure was on, so they fired uh, Terry Garvin, they fired Mel Phillips, and they also let go Pat Patterson. So there were three guys, that, and, and Vince said, yes, we let go of them. And um, and so at that time, they but were Patterson like, oh, well. resigned, though, right? Whether the circumstances were they allowed him to resign, whatever reason, right? Yes. Well, yeah. And, and yes. And then through some dubious uh, stuff, uh, they got Tom to sign some papers to bring him back. Um, and uh, because uh, he wound up coming back when they were at WrestleMania. But then, you know, right after the show, the Phil Donahue show, they they took me and my brother to Titan Towers. And um, at Titan Towers, we went up and we met with uh, Vince, Jerry McDivitt, uh, Linda McMahon. And uh, we sat down and basically uh, they started telling, you know, they were being very friendly to us. And um, they decided that they were going to give me some money to go away. So basically, they took $10,000 out of petty cash. And then they took me over to the bank and took another $10,000 out of the bank. So they gave me $20,000 in cash. And they told me, they asked me if I can just disappear. And so pretty much I said, oh, sure, no problem. But I wasn't going to disappear. I wasn't going to have them tell me what I had to do at that point. Uh, and Why is so, that? Because you were just annoying them, pushing your brother, uh, pushing your brother's story out there. Like what? Because if you weren't a ring boy, why would they care so much? Well, they cared because I was the older person. I was the one to, that that found all the kids, and uh, um, I was the one that found the lawyers. Uh, my brother uh, really listened to me. My brother was always telling the truth. And the reason they dealt with Tom and they dealt with me and, and, you know, Vince McMahon's a very powerful man. He isn't going to spend his time dealing with me or Tom to, you know, two street kids from the streets. And, you know, we, you know, here's this man having to spend his time with us for a couple of days because uh, his company is about, you know, he just lands the Hasbro account. And he knows that a sexual, a charge of sexual abuse with children would pretty much destroy him. So what they did is when we got to Titan Towers, they we left Titan and Tom went with Linda and I went with Vince and we went in separate cars and uh, we went out to a restaurant there. And when we got to the restaurant, there was nobody in the restaurant. It was like they pretty much told nobody to be there or spent some money not to have people be there. And we went in and uh, we sat down and talked. And, you know, Vince looked at me and uh, I remember Vince saying to me, I've lost it once before. If I lose it again, I'll get it back. It was like Vince was saying, Vince was pretty sure that this sexual abuse charge with the boys were really, uh, it was going to be what injured him. And so I felt that Vince really wanted the steroids to be the front story because he knew the front, the steroid story wasn't going to put him out of business. Uh, but he, but he knew that if the uh, sexual abuse story with the, with the boys took, you know, got traction, that was going to be what would really put him out of business. And uh, um, so at that time, what happened was the second day I was there, I was speaking to Vince then Vince came to me and told me that he had a couple of private investigators that he wanted me to speak to. And I told him, no, I said, I'm not speaking to your private investigators. 
And so at that point, when I looked at Vince, he, he was turning red and I could see the veins in his throat and neck and the side of his head. And he was angry and I could see this anger in him. At that point, I realized that this was just a game that they were playing with us. And so I got up and I told him no. And I, and I, when I left the room, I could see that they were quite mad. And my brother Tom was walking with me. And I looked at Tom as we were walking down the hallway. I said, Tom, that guy's full of shit. I said, you, we, I said, we shouldn't be here. I said, this is not going to end right. So Tom told me not to worry and just go back and, and, and go home. And uh, so I did. But I didn't know what they were going to do behind my back to destroy, to try to destroy me. So for the money you were given, do you have any proof since they paid you in cash that they actually paid you? And did you have to sign anything for no, accepting they that was yeah, it was petty cash, ten thousand dollars petty cash, which is pretty nice that you had ten thousand dollars in your petty cash. And then when he gave me the ten thousand uh, dollars, they told me that they would give me the other ten thousand uh, dollars. And I and I then at that point I said, well, I'm not waiting for it. I want it now because I figured if I left and didn't get the money, I would never see it. So at that point, they seen that I <laughs> they took me down to the bank the following day when the bank opened up. They got me $9,999. They kept it under that $10,000 mark. So they didn't have to write it down or anything. But it happened. And, uh, uh, and so I went back to, uh, at that time, I left my brother there alone, which I regret. And I went back to uh, Utica where I was uh, living, even though they wanted me to move out of Utica and just disappear. They actually asked me that. Now, your brother got hired back. At what point did they fire him again? Well, he got hired back. And uh, what happened, I was in, uh, well, what happened before that, though, um, I, at that time, I had a warrant for my arrest. And it was, uh, it was a felony warrant. But what they didn't realize is that I called up my probation officer and I paid my restitution off. But so what happened was I was with my son, who was three years old on a Sunday night in Utica, and a, a cop car came and a couple officers got out, knocked on the door. I didn't answer the door and they left. Then I called up my son's uh, mother and uh, she came and got him. And the following day I was in the house and two detectives came and arrested me. And they brought me uh, to the Utica police station and I waited there for Westchester County to come get me. And during this time, I had just paid $2,000 restitution. They did not know that I paid the restitution. Nobody knew, not even the cops knew. It wasn't even the system. And back then, it's not like it's now, you know. So I, I mailed the money in to my probation officer, and he told me as soon as he got the money that he was going to ask the judge to drop it. But when I got arrested, they brought me down to New York and... Uh, the following day, when I went to see the judge, the judge said, I have no evidence that you paid the judge the, that you paid this. So I'm going to let you come back to court tomorrow. If your probation officer isn't here to let me know this, I'm going to give you three to five years. So I came back the next day to court and he was there. So the judge dropped everything and basically uh, sent me down to New York City where I had a misdemeanor warrant. I went down there and I settled that, and um, then they weren't expecting me to get out. They thought for sure I was going to go to state prison. They were they were sure that they that's how they were going to get me out of the way. And I went to my brother Edwards when I left there, and he said to me, you know, just so you know, it was Tom and Steve, who was my best friend, that set me up. Uh, and, and they went and met with Vince McMahon and the lawyers there to tell them that I had these warrants. And so they said, well, you know, let's get them out of the way. So your and, brother uh, wanted so, you out of the way after, because why? Because they, they, they wanted to discredit me because they knew I had a lot of stuff. I was the one that was doing the investigating. You know, you had a lot of people that came out of the woodwork claiming to do an investigating. None of them really did investigating. Um, you know, we literally, you know, searched for these boys. Uh, How many and, boys you know, were involved in actually getting sexually harassed? They were sexually harassed. Uh, they so went through. 
But like how many? Was it 10, 5, 2? Oh, 20. Yeah, everybody I talked to, that any boy I talked to that was involved, um, they, uh, it was many boys. Okay, so one of the reasons that they would have paid you off then, according to you, is because you were recruiting all of these to get almost a clash action thing going. So they shut up the your brother with the settlement. Then they paid you the money to kind of get you to stop. Yeah, well, the the one the lawyer that we had working uh, for, for us, Pelosi, he, he was the lawyer that was the father of the lawyer from uh, Geraldo Rivera show, and uh, he basically because of. Uh, the fact of they had to keep it on the low. He couldn't really be involved and have his name on anything. Uh, he was also an ex um, ATF officer. Um, and he uh, helped him and I together went and tracked down these kids. We found them in, in Poughkeepsie. Uh, we found them all over Westchester County. Uh, oh, actually, I found one up in Utica, and he literally ran out of his job. He didn't want to talk. He he didn't want to talk to me, and uh, it, it turned out that they got to him up there already. And he literally ran out of his job out of the mall in Utica uh, because he did not want to talk to me. And there was a group of kids up in Poughkeepsie, uh, pretty rough young kids, and they all knew each other. You know, Tom. All these kids knew each other. And they were everywhere. They were all over the country. And, you know, that's one of the things that I would hope to see is that there are kids out there that that know stuff about this. And, you know, the whole the situation now is a lot different than when it was back then. And people should realize that in the state of New York, you can come forward now and tell your story and legally. You know, they committed crimes and got away with it. I'm not sure if Terry Garvin's still alive. I've heard. Terry's dead. Terry's dead. Patterson's quite old. And I've heard that there might be some uh, issues with him slowly going mentally, according to reports. Uh, but and Vince, you think Vince knew about what was going on with Phillips and all them and just allowed it Vince... to happen? Because I couldn't see that. Yeah. The only way Vince wouldn't know is if he literally never went to his shows. You know, here's the, the part. You know, here's you have an Afri African American man running around with a bunch of little white kids around these arenas, going to these motels. I mean, this had to be noticed by a lot of people, you know, especially back in those days. And Vince knew about it. Vince admitted that he knew about it because he fired he, um, he fired Phillips before that, uh, a couple months before that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if it was a couple months or a couple years. He let him go, and then one month later, he brought him back because he knew he was having trouble. And, you know, Bruno San Martino is the one who told me about this. And Bruno despised Vince McMahon. Because of what he did to him, but yeah. he despised him and he despised the, what was going on in this organization with these boys, you know, and uh, all the wrestlers from back then, if you talk to any of them, whether it's Billy Graham or whatever, they all knew about the stuff. Yeah, but unfortunately, well, I guess what happened eventually, they brought Billy Graham back to work for them. They bought... Bruno San Martino back even, I guess it's just money talks and people forget as yep. as time goes on. But it's a lot a of thing. people were shocked when Bruno came back after all that he said over the years. Yeah, but and supposedly it was a huge shocked. amount of money that they gave him yeah. to go in the WWE Hall of Fame. Well, I was very shocked when Bruno came back because Bruno was seen so sincere. And he was, you know, he just seemed like a very honorable guy. And I was very surprised. But I think it was the Hall of Fame thing. I think it was more Bruno just thought he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. So when they released Tom from WWE, what was the reason given when he was uh, released? Well, they set him up. What, what they did basically is they set Tom up and they gave him this con crazy contract that they would let him go back to school. And if he failed school, they could fire him. 
They knew that he was going to fail. Scully was a street kid. He, he didn't even graduate high school. So he's taking these classes at Westchester County. And, uh, and once he stopped going, they, it opened a door for them to let him go again. So they let him go. But they also, so when Tom left that time, uh, he came and told me what happened again. I said, Tom, <laughs> I tell you this is going to happen. So Tom went and got another lawyer. He had a pretty good lawsuit because one of the things in the next lawsuit that came out was that they locked him in the bill and then wouldn't let him out of Titan Towers because they wanted him to sign paperwork. Uh, stating other things, and Tom refused to sign it. So when he tried to leave the building, they locked the doors and they wouldn't let him out. And uh, the main reason with Tom, Tom, Tom never, you know, he was your typical sexual abused uh, victim. Uh, he he basically handled things wrong several times, you know, and uh, you know, and they knew it, and they. You know, and they uh, they really put the uh, like Jerry McDivitt's a brilliant lawyer. I mean, the guy is brilliant and uh, he's one of the best lawyers there is. And they left Tom with Jerry and Jerry worked them over every day and just basically told him everything he wanted to hear. And they just had him signing things left and right. So why did Tom later defend uh, the McMahons and support Linda in her? election campaign that she didn't end up winning? Uh, well, what happened was uh, Tom uh, Tom became a bodyguard in New York, became very successful man, and he had a good job. And uh, whenever something came up, Linda would never contact him unless something was coming up. Linda or Jerry McDivitt would contact Tom with emails and we and those emails are around from what I understand. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. And where they came out and they said to him, hey, uh, listen, um, there's going to be some stories coming out. Uh, will you make sure that you take our side and stuff? Uh, there was an incident where, you know, Tom was able to pay for his house because uh, there was a lot of money in a 401k. Tom didn't even realize was there, uh, and he and the four hundred one k was almost as large as uh, the settlement, uh, and that Tom had because when he got fired from the company, he still had the four hundred one k. Didn't even realize that he had that kind of money in it. Wow! Yep. And he used that as a huge down payment on his house, uh, and and you know what? It kept it. It was just like you're a sexual assault victim. He, he kept going back to the people that uh, treated him. He thought they were treating him nice. Uh, and he kind of regretted it because he had a lot of emotional issues because of what happened. And uh, he realized what was going to happen. He wanted to go take some uh, 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 therapy classes for the sexual abuse he suffered. And he, told, he called up Jerry McDivitt and he said to Jerry, he says, Jerry, I think you should pay for the classes because you people did this to me. And Jerry McDivitt said, absolutely not. We're not paying for them. And at that point, Tom realized that was the moment that Tom realized that they always used him. That's all that was ever about. They were using him. The one person they feared was Tom. And that's why every time something happened, they always got they contacted Tom. And they would always say to Tom, so where's your brother Lee? Always, always asking where I was and what I was doing. Did he sign a non-disclosure agreement when the settlement happened where he couldn't talk about the issues in the case again public? Uh, I No, he refused to sign that. Um, and that was the smartest thing that he did. I mean, that was the only thing that his lawyer did that was actually intelligent. Um, because we found out eventually that, you know, that Tom's lawyer actually did the injunction to stop, uh, Tom went on Geraldo Rivera and they wanted to stop that from going on the, on the show. So they sued Geraldo Rivera with the injunction to stop it. And, uh, so what they did is, uh, uh, they had Fuchberg, uh, shut it down. Uh, so basically what happened is. Alan Fuchberg, well, Fuchberg got paid by the WWF to uh, um, to stop 
Tom Show from Geraldo Rivera from coming out. And Geraldo Rivera, you know, anybody can go see the video. It's, you know, it was really upset that the show was, and he even came up and said, you know, Tom was supposed to be here, but they, st- you know, because of the, them stopping it with an injunction, we can't have him here. And Geraldo said that right on TV. Is there any news on if Mel Phillips is still alive since we haven't heard Mel, from him? Mel died. <laughs> you know, Mel uh, died a couple of years ago. Um, I believe he was up in the New England area. And uh, What did he do he after there? wrestling? You know, he just basically disappeared. It's obvious that they took care of him, and he just basically disappeared. And uh, um, from what I understood, a lot of his stuff, uh, he had a bunch of stuff in a storage area up there that started after he died started showing up at these wrestling shows and stuff so uh you know always wondered what what the heck was in those lockers <laughs> with so, that mail hat so why are you bringing all this back to light now uh i know that there's some other stories coming out in some other magazines and so forth uh any reason that you yes. you want to bring this well, what's happened over the years, there was a lot of things said, really bad stuff about me, people that don't even know me. They never came to me to talk to me. You know, these guys, they all write me stories. And the mistake they made, they always kept them wrestling stories. And this wasn't a wrestling story. This was about boys being molested by a major corporation. And they never treated it like that. They treated it like a wrestling story. All these wrestling writers, they all jumped the board uh, once the uh, suit came out, uh, well, once the threat of a lawsuit came out, they all came out of the woodwork. And, you know, I always said to myself, these guys always knew, but Vince uh, buttered their bread. But they said so many lies about me. There was one lie where they said that I was in at the Phil Donahue show and I said that Vince was the only one that cared about these boys. That literally came out in a penthouse story. And... Uh, uh, I don't know who released that garbage, but it was a total lie. And I even called up uh, the guy that wrote the story, and they were gonna. Uh, uh, they promised me that they were gonna do a retraction on it, which never happened. Um, but over the years, just people that don't know me continuously talk about me and, and just say horrible things. And and then I recently seen uh, a couple months ago. Uh, you did a show and somebody was mocking my brother, not realizing that he is uh, he suffered sexual abuse and he was mocking him like it was a joke, you know, and that really bothered me, you know, and this person knows who they are. But what they did was just really crummy and they should really understand what people of sexual abuse go through for the rest of their life. So what did you end up doing as your career? You mentioned you both had a rough upbringing. Were you able to uh, turn yourself around and have a good life? Well, I'm in college right now. I'm, I'm 59 years old, and I'm, I'm, I almost got my bachelor's degree. And I'm, uh, my grade point average is a 4.0. And I'm proud of that because at my age that I went back, I've owned a rec- couple of restaurants. I've had my up- I had my ups and my downs. But in general, you know, I can't complain. You know, uh, I, I, I have my health, but I'm more concerned about my brother right now because the whole mental impact of this and every time something happens, it takes a toll on him. And, you know, uh, when that's like when people speak about him and, and, and they're rude about it, they should really understand that they shouldn't be speaking about him like that. Uh, because they know nothing of this story except what they've heard. And a lot of people that uh, I knew in the wrestling world that uh, were, were going back and telling Vince everything that was being said and done. You couldn't trust nobody, especially the wrestling insiders. No, there's very few people you can trust in wrestling, but at least there's no more ring boys used by WWE. They're a big company now, publicly traded different situation now yeah well and what bugs me is linda mcmahon she, she, here she is she's the head of uh, uh donald trump's campaign and uh when she went through her hearings uh um 
Blumenthal, who's a senator that she ran ran against in the state of Connecticut, knew about all the stuff with the Ring Boys, but yet when they had to vote on her to to be on in the cabinet, Blumenthal voted for her, a Democrat that knew what happened. Because they were trying to get a hold of me, Blumenthal's camp. They were trying to get a hold of Tom. So they knew about these charges against Linda. So a lot of people just don't care. Well, it's good to get your side on the record now. Is there anything else you want to say to uh, to close this off that we may not have covered? Yeah, well, there's a, uh, um, there's going to be some information coming out. Um, uh, in this story coming out, uh, some information that's never been heard before. And also, uh, I'm going to be doing a show tomorrow. Uh, it's, um, it's called General Zod's uh, Phantom Zone. And uh, I'm going to disclose some stuff there that has never been disclosed. And I have some stuff over the years that I've never disclosed. And I would have loved to disclose it years ago. But the reason I didn't disclose it, because none of these so-called writers and uh, um, these uh, reporters ever came to me to ask me any of this stuff. Um, and it's too bad because there was a lot of stuff that was there that Vince never got out of me. And, you know, I gave Vince nothing. He knows you know, Vince despised me and I despise him as a human being because he's an awful man. All right. Well, we can close it at that if you want. Look, I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, you know, I could stand here all day and say the things I, you know, there's so many things to say about this. Uh, but, you know, one thing I really do appreciate is the fact that you uh, gave me the opportunity to speak because the people in the wrestling world really don't like to step on Vince's toes because, he, like I said, he butters their bread and they don't right. like to mess with him. Um, well, it's safe to say I'm never going to get uh, get any more money from WWE, so it has no impact on me whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. He, well, uh, the last thing he wants to do is uh, watch a couple of people that got some money out of him. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But For I sure. do, like I said, I do appreciate the fact that you are giving me this opportunity, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see it. Uh, to see uh, how how this turns out, and with the story coming out, it's a very powerful story. It's coming out in a in a in a very a major outlet, and uh, probably the largest outlet that's ever carried a story about this. So Vince, if you hear that, and uh, I'm sure you're going to have someone's going to run to you and tell you about this uh, video. Um, yeah, you got other problems. It ain't me. You better worry about this story coming out. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.